We're here with composer Nina Shaker, who is Young Concert Artist's newest composer in residence. She'll be in residence from 2021 to 2023. It's great to have you here. How are you feeling? I'm good. Thanks so much for interviewing me, Saad. No, it's great to have you. Um, and, and it's such an honor to have you be the next composer in residence with Young Concert Artists. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm really excited to be joining Young Concert Artists and to follow in your footsteps. <laughs> it's, it's a real honor. No, you're going to do great. I, I, I know that. That's, that's for sure. I want to talk today about like, how you got here. Now you're doing a PhD at Princeton University in composition. I know before that you were at USC, fight on. And then before that, you were at University of Michigan doing a dual degree in chemical engineering and music composition. So, I mean, that's quite a varied background. And I, and I don't even know what you did before then. So it would be great to just get a little bit about your background and how you got to this point in general. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when I was growing up, I, my first instrument was piano and I would just, because my brother was playing piano, I wanted to play it too, honestly. Um, and like, I would write these little songs at the piano. And then, um, I always tell the story, like the first instance of me, like composing something that was like a real piece, um, was I, I wrote this little mini piece, just like two lines. And then um, my brother, who's eight years older than me, like, you know, he had learned a little bit of more theory and, and piano lessons. And then he beefed it up into this like real piece. And then we sent it to a magazine and then they published it. But then I always like felt really guilty because it was like mostly his work, not mine, even though my name was on it. <laughs> but um, I mean, I became a real composer. So I hopefully have redeemed myself. <laughs> but um, yeah, but then I, you know, and middle school i started learning the flute and that's now my main instrument um and then you know in, in high school i played also a little bit of jazz saxophone also um and then when i was deciding to go to college i it was kind of hard for me to really make a decision because um you know my parents were rightfully so pretty nervous about um me having financially stable career in music and so they were really worried about me just kind of throwing all my eggs into um the music basket and going to music school and, and not really doing anything else and so actually to be perfectly honest um initially me doing an engineering degree along with the music degree was a compromise at first you know it was just kind of giving me another option. Um, but then eventually once I, I went to school and the longer I was in it, um, the more I really loved that I was doing two different programs. You know, I really, um, I, I've loved how like engineers think so differently than artists do. Um, and I, I always give this example of like Flint water crisis. And, um, you know, I, I grew up in Michigan and not too far away from Flint. And, um, you know, when that crisis was going on, like artists were always, um, you know, they were trying to like do concerts or like, you know, fundraising and things like that by performances. But like in my engineering classes, like we were learning about what was actually causing the crisis. And we had like homework problems dedicated to like what what was causing the corrosion and things like that. So I really loved that I got to have both sides of like learning about different kinds of issues um, yeah. And so then eventually I decided that I, I really wanted to pursue music as my career. And, and so then when I was doing my master's at USC, I, I, I only did music, um, composition. Um, yeah. And then, and then now I'm here. <laughs> now I'm here at Princeton and, and then I joined YCA. <laughs> yeah, see, it's just as easy as that. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering, you have this of course, dual background. For you, was there a moment when you thought, you know, I just want to pursue composition? Or was it more of a gradual process? I mean, what was it for you? I'm assuming while you're at, at the University of Michigan, it made you decide, I'm going to go into composition at USC. Because even at USC, there's a lot of great programs there, not just music, of course. So, And it's interesting also that you stayed, uh, you're, it's a very rare case where you stayed in a university environment for all three degrees rather than you never went to a conser like a like a uh, traditional conservatory so i find that also very uh, fascinating too yeah yeah i i really love the university environment just because i think i i really love um learning about different kinds of issues learning about um how to think about things from more than one side and so 
Um, I always felt, and also just my, my, no, nobody in my family were musicians, you know, growing up. So I was like the first one. And so, um, I think my, just from the way I was, um, brought up, I, I think honestly, sometimes I tend to understand non artist brains a little better than artist brains. Um, and so I think that's part of the reason why I chose to go to university settings for, for all my degrees. But, yeah, you know, when I was at, at Michigan, when I was doing my engineering degree also, I there was a, a point where I, I was working. I, I did an internship for, for Procter & Gamble. I worked for Bounty, actually, like the paper towel company. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, it was really fun. And I, I really loved um, having that experience of making paper towel and coming up with new um, ideas for the design and things like that. I was in their research and development team. But then I didn't feel fulfilled doing that job, even though it was a really fun job. I just felt like I was missing something. I, I was having a really hard time also composing while I was working there. I just it was hard for me to do like a full like nine to five job and just compose on the side. I, I think at that point, I, I just really what I love about composing is, is a way for me to kind of express my identity, express my emotions in a way that I couldn't through engineering. Because of that, I, I just felt like I, I was ready to just kind of commit to music, even though I, I still ended up finishing both degrees just because I'm stubborn and <laughs> want to give up anything. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the moment that I decided. Wow. And when you were pursuing these joint degrees, did did the people in the music classes know you were doing the engineering and vice versa? Or was there this uh, kind of uh, inner, I got to keep both things separate. I don't want my friends to know that I do one or the other. You know, I think most of my friends knew I was doing one or the other. But I will say that amongst like faculty, you know, there's like this mindset that I think is a really... Um, old fashioned, like dangerous mindset where, um, you know, people often say like only do the arts or go pursue a career in the arts if you can't mm -hmm. do anything else. And I, I don't think that's a really healthy mindset. You know, I think we're all multidimensional people. We have lots of different interests. Um, you know, and that's also like perpetuating some sort of like suffering artists. Like I have to do It's like this really dangerous way of looking at things. So, but because of that, I would sometimes be a little bit careful telling my music faculty, especially about my engineering um, degree. Most of my engineering professors were actually really excited. I was doing a music degree. They're like, oh, that's so interesting. And some of them actually had worked with some faculty in the music school. You know, if they have kids, you know, some of them study with people in the music school. But like in, amongst music faculty, I did try to kind of compartmentalize just to show that I think people, there was a fear that I might not be as committed because a lot of people just kind of do the degree and then just go off and get like a nine to five job and stop pursuing music. And I really wanted to show, especially after I had decided I was going to do music seriously as my career, um, that I I was fully invested. Yeah. I mean, this, this idea of commitment that you talk about is so interesting because it's a word I don't really hear that much uh, outside of music. Commitment is something that they, that they're you know, if you're someone that works a nine to five job, you know, no one's going to tell you that you're not committed. But if right. you're a, a practicing violinist and you only are work, are you only working from nine to five? It's like, wow, you're you're slacking off. Like it doesn't <laughs> doesn't sound like you're really serious about auditioning for an orchestra or being a, a soloist. And I've heard this uh, and seen it so many times. So that's a, that's a great point that you bring up. One of the first pieces uh, that I've heard of yours is a piece called uh, Quirkhead from 2017 that you wrote for Tony Arnold, the soprano and the third angle string quartet. Can you tell us a little bit about that piece and how that came about? Yeah, you know, that piece was kind of in my own short, <laughs> short lived span of my body of work. Um, it was kind of like a pioneering piece for me just because I, it was the first time I really tried writing my own text also. I mean, I had written some of my own texts before for vocal pieces, but for this one, I really wanted to do something that was very personal and I hadn't really done that before. And so this piece is about um, my experiences with obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. And when I was growing up, I, I had pretty severe OCD. I, there was a point where almost everything I did was ba based on a compulsion, like almost every, like even swallowing, like I would count the number of times I 
was breathing. It was really dangerous, honestly. But like when I was going through that, I was part of my OCD was that I couldn't tell, I couldn't use the word OCD. And I also didn't really know when uh, before I even knew what OCD was. Like I, I had never, I thought I was just quirky. And so I invented this name Quirkhead for myself because I didn't even know there was a name for it. And when I was in middle school, I had a teacher first kind of notice little compulsions that I was doing. And one thing specifically is that in my <laughs> very strange brain, I, I associate um, letters and um, words with uh, different connotations. And because of that, I, I associate like left. I like the word left better than right. Um, and so words that I liked or perceived as better I put more to the left and then words I perceive more like I didn't like as much I put to the right and it's nothing to actually do with the actual object it's just like the way that the letters work in my brain this on, on a test um one of my middle school teachers noticed <laughs> like I uh, and fill in the blank I would write things more to the left or the right and then she asked me what does this mean and then I was like I don't know and I was like so scared because nobody had confronted me about this and then um, I was explaining more about my compulsions. And then she said, I think you have OCD. And it was like this big moment in my life where somebody had kind of helped me figure out my identity. And it felt really validating to know that I wasn't alone. Um, so yeah, this piece is about that. Um, and yeah, it's a really personal piece. It was written as part of um, Gabrielina Frank has this amazing academy called the um, Creative Academy of Music, and um, it was written in the the very first cycle of her program, right when she was just testing things out. Um, so I was really grateful to her for fostering a really wonderful environment with uh, me and and Tony and and a Third Angle. They were all just wonderful to work with. If you don't know about the background of the piece, it's actually uh, quite humorous. But then when you learn more about, you know, like what's your story behind it, there is uh, you know, like a serious side to it too, a kind of uh, kind of reckoning with the have and processing it through music. So when you hear it for the, like when I heard it for the first time, at least my experience was, wow, this is a really humorous uh, piece, you know, without knowing anything about it, just listening to it. Uh, but then when you, when you hear like this recounting of it, and I've, there are also some interviews on YouTube where I've, where I've heard you recount a little bit of this. There's a completely different dimension uh, that opens up for the audience members. So it's it's like a kind of a rare uh, instance when it actually really changes your experience hearing the piece when you know uh, for uh, better or worse what the program program yeah. of the piece is. Uh, it's, uh, it's a really uh, not really the right word to use, but in a traditional context, uh, yeah. uh, what, the, what the meaning behind the piece is. Yeah. I mean, I kind of love um, humor as like an inlet to something deeper. And, and, and I kind of love that, you know, even with this piece, I, I deliberately wanted it to be super kooky. And, and it's funny if you don't actually know, you know, when she's singing like dog to the left, fish to the right and things like that. Um, like, Normally, that would just sound like some kind of, I don't know, like Gertrude Stein, like some absurdist kind of thing. But um, like for me, it was meaning something obviously a lot more personal. And um, yeah, and it's funny, even there, like I kind of purposely tried to go against a lot of my compulsions. Like I actually probably would put dog to the right <laughs> instead of to the left and fish. Like I, I was trying to like work through that when I was writing the piece. So like that also, it's funny because like an audience member wouldn't know that unless I told them that. Um, but for me, it was like these little personal victories that I kept for myself um, in the piece. Dog to the left, dog to the left, dog to the left, fish to the right, dog to the left, dog to the left, fish to the right, bear to the left, fish to the right, dog to the left, bear to the left, dog to the left, pig to the right, bear to the left, pig to the right, dog to the left. When you wrote Quirkhead 2017, you were at Michigan at this time? Yeah. So you mm -hmm. were at Michigan at this time. 
And then when you went to USC, what year was that? Uh, that must have been, I think, fall 2018. And shortly after that, you wrote the piece Hush uh, yeah. during your time at USC, right? Uh -huh. How did that come about? Yeah. So Hush is a funny piece because I initially, when I, it was commissioned, so it was initially commissioned by um, this duo called Ray Kelly Duo. It's Vicky Ray and Aaron Kelly. Um, and they're both really amazing uh, pianists based in L.A., um, which is where I was living at the time. And, uh, you know, they had this project. They've been really wanting to do a lot of microtonal piano pieces. They use like a MIDI keyboard and use this the software called Pianotech to make all kinds of custom tunings and things like that. And I was pretty freaked out, honestly, when they initially commissioned this piece because I hadn't really done anything like that before. And I was also kind of newer to electronics and things like that. So I, I was kind of really nervous. And, um, when I was listening to a lot of other examples of microtonal pieces, you know, there's a lot of like anopope, like there's a lot of these really, um, heavy, like dramatic, really like percussive kinds of pieces that are microtonal. And there wasn't as many, um, like softer side pieces. Um, and so I, at that time, I, I kind of had this idea of thinking about like a music box and how music boxes always have kind of wonking tuning, wonking tuning systems and they're not um, standard, you know, from music box to music box. Um, and like at that time, I was feeling really homesick, honestly. <laughs> I, I was really missing um, my family. I, was like, I want a hug. But then I was like, I'll write myself a hug. So this piece is supposed oh, to be wow. like a musical <laughs> hug. And it's like with the, the tuning system, um, you know, the way that it works is that um, as you move lower and lower in the keyboard, it gradually gets flatter. And then one keyboard is just like, already flatter than another one and so from that as you work through the piece eventually the, the pitches get farther and farther apart but then it kind of surrounds you in this sort of um music boxy world that is it goes beyond honestly like the high tinkly sounds it goes to this kind of um immersive world and yeah yeah it's it was it's just kind of amazing the way that um, the vibrations work <laughs> throughout the different ranges of, of the piano. Yeah, I just want to know, um, how did you come up with this tuning system? I'm going to show on the screen the, sure. the, the various uh, piano tech models that you have. But how did you, I I've, I've personally haven't seen this kind of like inverse thing going on where you have the low end uh, very low in terms of pitch and then the high end higher. But then on the two pianos, or rather keyboards, the like the middle inflection point is different on the two keyboards, mm -hmm. correct? I mean, yeah. how did you come up with that? And you're like, I can't even imagine like, <laughs> you know, this, did you, were you improvising uh, on the keyboard and just and kind of went uh, from the bottom to the top and said, okay, I really like the way that expansion of pitch is happening. Was it from another piece you, I'm just so curious because when I saw it, I was actually when I rather when I heard the piece, I was just like, wow, I don't, I don't know what the heck is going on, <laughs> you know? And uh, it wasn't until when I saw the score, um, okay, okay, fine, I, I, I see what's happening, but I still don't really get it, you know, yeah. when I see the score, but it, it doesn't even matter because I, I'm just like, like what you said, it feels like a hug. And I don't even care what the microtonal tuning is. Yeah. Uh, there is yeah. that facet of it too. Yeah, that's such a good point. I, I think that like, I think so many pieces that involve microtonality make it about like this tuning system. Like that mm -hmm. is like the focus of the piece. And I, I kind of wanted to do something where it was more just like a tool to get somewhere rather than like being the focus of the piece. And Honestly, I think part of it happened by accident. You know, you can just kind of draw <laughs> tuning curves and then just see what it sounds like. Uh -huh. But I think that um, I had this idea of like starting. I mean, the form is actually pretty straightforward. It starts up high and then eventually goes down low. Um, and as because it's such a straightforward form, it's where it just gradually gets lower and lower. Then, you know, I thought, well, what if the pianos pull apart? So again, like the slope of one turn tuning curve is a little bit steeper than the other. Um, and then everything mm -hmm. is just gradually flatter. And yeah, so because of that, like, 
it was kind of a mix of just like by accident, me just trying random things and then improvising, but then also like planning this form. Yeah, it, it's just, it's really interesting because I think I deliberately didn't want to do something that was like a standard tuning system or something that where like, even though it's actually quite like the process is actually quite uh, deliberate in this piece, like you don't necessarily hear that process like in the tuning system. So yeah, I, I kind of wanted it to be more about just like the hug and just like, you know, when you get that, the slight beating sounds and when there's like the dissonance between the two tuning mm-hmm. systems, um, it's more about that rather than really like this is this um, frequency against this one. You know, it's it's a little bit more general than that. And you mentioned that you didn't really care about the relationship between the frequencies or that you're following a really strict uh, microtonal schema. And you mentioned the hug. And, you know, when I look at the actual graph, you know, if I, when you, when you hug someone too, I don't know if this is what you were thinking or, you know, you kind of, some, some people hug like this and it kind of <laughs> looks like that too. You have the high and the low and it has that kind of, uh, uh, kind of visual aid too. So, I mean, that's just something I guess added. Yeah, so, that's a good, uh, that's uh, a good point. It's just something I realized yeah. uh, just now. You know, it's interesting. I wonder, you know, if this, if, if the piece catches on, you know, this is going to be the name, Nina Shaker tuning <laughs> system. <laughs> and uh, that would be cool. Because that I there just are drew systems... random lines. <laughs> that well, be, that's know, how you invent things. <laughs> I mean, there are, there are pieces like um, Vortex Temporum. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with that piece, but, you know, that piece too, it's kind of like you have four pitches that are detuned down a quarter tone. And it's honestly kind of random. Right. That those are the four pitches. And and there are works that are written just because of that piece to be programmed. So right. you, you know, you never know. So that's true. <laughs> that's, that's true. I mean, when I heard the piece, I said, Wow, you know, this tuning system, it could be, it could be, you know, I am curious to see what other things could be done with it because the idea mm-hmm. of this expansion of pitch, um, of course it would be very difficult to do it uh without the use of electronics. Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> that would be uh, very hard. <laughs> so I want to talk about now your piece, Dear Abby, which you wrote for two singers in Symphonetta. And this piece is a little bit more recent from 2020. Were you or still at USC during this time when you wrote this piece? Or were you already at Princeton? Yeah, so actually, you know, the original version of this piece was a I have a chamber version of this piece that I wrote for a group that is based in Ann Arbor, but I and I was already living in LA and at USC at the time. Um, and that was kind of a kooky instrumentation. Their group is like um, a violin, bassoon, piano percussion. Um, and it's like a really challenging ensemble to write for, but they're all really, um, that group is called Front Porch. They're all really um, good friends and really great musicians. So I, it was actually for like singing chamber ensemble. And then for this version, Albany Symphony had commissioned something for their Dogs of Desire group. Um, and they were doing this. It was kind of, I mean, this was right in the beginning of the pandemic and they were all these emergency COVID projects popping up. And so this was another one of those. They had gotten some uh, COVID relief money um, and then we're commissioning, I, I think it was like 10 composers to write these virtual pieces that they were recording virtually and then releasing videos for. And so, yeah, so then this piece, um, Dear Abby, is about like the advice columns, Dear Ad- Abby. And, you know, this was like a column in the in the 50s um, where people would write in and um, say like, questions about like their domestic life you know just basic things of like oh i don't know what 
that like my kids don't like eating this food <laughs> or something. What what do I do to cook for them? Or like, should I work? You know, even questions like that. Like my husband doesn't want me to work. There are, like all these different kinds of questions that um, you know range from being really mundane questions to really honestly pretty charged um, like gender related questions. You know, and really kind of enforcing a lot of these gender norms of like. Is the woman's place in the house? You know, what does womanhood even mean? Um, like, if you were thinking even now, like, um, how does that relate to any kind of like queer identity or um, trans identities and things like that? This piece is kind of, again, it's one of the pieces where I wrote the text for it, but it was kind of related off to, of um, some of these advice columns that I had read um, from old newspapers. And um, yeah, in the beginning, they. They talk about like shaving their legs and uh, and, and things like that. And um, again, it's a, a personal piece, uh, but um, it's a little bit uh, more charged, I think, socially. Yeah, and it's it's such a challenge too for the musicians because, uh, like like what you're saying, you know, there's all these uh, issues of you know, especially gender and identity. And of course, there are, of, uh, you know, there are a lot of men in the, uh, in the recording that you have, too. And they're also seeing this stuff. So there's also that juxtaposition going on. But they seem to have, be having a lot of fun, actually, too. Uh, they, they look like they're having fun, at least to me. So, Yeah, that was a, it was a tricky decision because I was trying to decide. Um, I mean, I did ask um, Albany to send me like a roster of their performers for, for that um recording and so that I could kind of make decisions but then I really thought like no I think everybody should be singing these words you know regardless of their own gender mm -hmm. um and uh, yeah like you were saying there were a lot of like cisgender men who were singing these lines and um really talking about things that honestly they may never have thought of before or might not relate to otherwise and um but I, I think that that was good to have them sing that. And, and, and it's interesting because as it starts with everybody singing and then slowly dwindles down to only the two singers, like that itself also is kind of a strange process because there are sometimes like men alone who are singing these, these lines, um, you know, and then there's women, of course, singing the lines, you know, with the two singers, um, the two, uh, Lucy de Grey and, and Lucy Fitzgibbon. But uh, as they, even just that process, it was like a tricky thing to kind of wrap my head around of like who should be singing what. Yeah, you're not even, you're not just dealing with musical decisions in terms of orchestration. <laughs> right, right. It seems right. like such an antiquated word to use in this context. Yeah. <laughs> but you're also exactly. dealing with the social ramification of what you're doing too. Do you paint your toenails with blue? With what you're trying to say, I mean, it's it's important that everybody is included, right? I mean, for for this message to 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 make sense within the scope of the right. piece, right? So that's what I found. It, it it reminded me of Corkhead in a lot of ways, as well, because again, I <laughs> my first impression, wow, this is a funny piece. Just talking about the painting toenails red, <laughs> and shaving legs, and and glitter, and all this shimmery stuff. Uh, but then when you, you know, you open the hood and see what it's, it's kind of, it's kind of like watching a, you know, like a monologue, like a comedy show in a way. Uh, a lot of what they're saying is, is funny, but then when they recount their experiences of why they came up with that joke, it, um, 
maybe it's not a completely analogous, but it's just something that, uh, you know, it, it, it comes to mind uh, when I listen to especially these two pieces, Quirkhead and, and Dear Abby. Yeah, and it's interesting. A lot of comedians, I think th a lot of comedy comes from a really dark place, honestly. It comes from like observations in the world or maybe even like their own experiences and their own struggles. And then it, it's like another vehicle out of that and like a way of mm -hmm. communication. So I of again, like I, I often think that humor is a really good in. It grabs your attention, I think, a little bit more sometimes than like immediately being really dramatic and like um like emotionally sad or like charged that way um mm -hmm. i think sometimes humor is a way that it's like a, a vehicle for empathy i think vehicle for empathy yeah that's a that's a great way to put it and, and you're right when you have these pieces that are like have a lot of angst uh, that's one definitely one kind of emotion i hear a lot with contemporary music or not even contemporary music mm. even even 19th century music a lot of a lot of romantic 19th century orchestral music has that kind of feeling you there is no like room for guessing what the <laughs> composer was thinking right it's like that's the emotion um but with with, with your music there is that there is that multi-layer uh, going on and it takes a few times to really understand what uh, the piece is about not just musically which is usually what happens it's the it's the musical language that's so difficult to get through but with your music it's it's uh, it's the message uh which i find uh refreshing uh as a you know 21st century uh music uh, creator i guess whatever you want to call it yeah mm -hmm. so that's dear abby and uh, one of your chamber orchestra orchestral pieces and then you have your latest piece, one of your latest pieces, I should say, because you write a ton of music, and I want to talk about that as well. I want to ask you about that after we get through some of these pieces. But you have this uh, piece, uh, Turn Your Feet Around, uh, which is just, you know, immediately, before you even hear the piece, the title grabs, grabs you. <laughs> uh, so you, you went one step before and, and had, uh, you know, this, this title that I don't know if people, uh, you know, these days would know that song off the top of their you know front of mind but at least my mom would play a lot of 80s music uh, growing up and i know all that stuff uh, bg's air supply uh you know uh, all that kind of uh, music um so i wanted i would like to know um first of all what is this piece <laughs> and uh, and second of all uh why <laughs> yeah yeah you know i mean I think Gloria Estefan is um, like an icon, <laughs> honestly. I want, like, I wish, you know, even with her, her pictures of her hair, I'm like, my hair is poofy. Like, I want to be like her. Um, but, you know, I, I had this idea, you know, and especially during the pandemic. Um, and I was thinking about like the way that, you know, we're all in our own spaces. We can't really move around, but we're also like really hyper conscious of our bodies suddenly. Like we're really conscious of our health. Like anytime if we even just have like a cough, like even if it's like one time we're coughing, we're like, oh my gosh, am I sick? You know, we're really aware. And at the same time, we're also like during the pandemic, I was sitting on my couch like all the time <laughs> or I was like working and like sitting and I wasn't really able to move as much as I was before. Um, and definitely not able to like move in a space with other people. You know, that was kind of not happening for obvious reasons of social distancing, et cetera. So I had this idea of kind of turning like a concert, which also usually concerts are really rigid, right? Everybody's sitting. They're like, just they're not supposed to move too much the audience. It doesn't get to really move around. Um, and I kind of wanted to break that norm a little bit and have something where people can move and react however they wanted to. And, um, you know, I was, th I had this strange idea of turning like this little concert hall into like a nightclub and having people get to move however they wanted. Um, and so like in the space, you know, obviously the title turn your feet around is like a portmanteau of turn the beat around and get on your feet which are two of her classic songs the piece um uses these really tiny micro samples of get on your feet um which i kind of warp and um twist around a lot and with some other samples that i use um 
And yeah, and then it turns, it's kind of this fun reimagining of, of movement and dance and, and things like that um, in a concert space and allowing people to kind of express themselves however they want. Um, yeah, even in the score, there are like emojis in the score. It's like a foot emoji, like for any time they have to do like a movement of their choice. Um, yeah, it's a really fun piece. Yeah, I mean, it's a very like, you know, present minded kind of piece. I mean, that even though it takes uh, it takes inspiration from, you know, a song, a pop song from you know, 30, 40 years ago, the it's it feels like so present i don't know i don't know why it just feels like it's a piece that w would have only been written in 2021 or 2020 like during this time and mm -hmm. uh when you when you see the the visual uh recording uh, of the piece and you ha and you know okay in the backdrop of all this is the is the pandemic going on it even adds more to uh, the the kind of loose fun that they're al allowed to have that you're allowed to have during this time when it feels like uh, a lot of feel, people feel like oh you know we're living in a difficult time you know this is not the time to have fun or it's very hard for us to to get in that mindset to have fun so I feel like your piece is a is a really great uh, respite for that in a way that when you when you watch yeah. it you're you're like allowing the audience member to to join in and let it it's okay to have fun uh when you're uh, in your in your daily life and i mean for me that's the message at least i got when i again first impression uh watching the piece happen yeah you know and i was thinking like even in the lyrics of the song like the original like get on your feet i mean she says like you know, get up and make it happen or like, you know, find it, you'll pull through. Like, you know, it's just like, it's kind of this uplifting song anyway about like getting yourself out of a hard situation, which is kind of like what we're doing right now, getting ourselves out of a hard pandemic. I kind of wanted to keep with that message and have something that was really fun and uplifting, but also a chance for performers to kind of put themselves in it. And it was interesting because when I was writing it, you know, it was it was for Alarm Will Sound. And Alan Pearson um, was so great to work with. But, you know, and initially, like, there were a lot of questions of like, wait, do you, we can really do any movement? Like, do you want us to do specific choreography? I'm like, no, I want this to be like, fun. Like, it's not meant to be like a normal concert piece where everything is so, um, you know, so like composer driven of like this is what you do here and this like you know right. i wanted people to be able to express themselves however they want and have fun with it so um yeah even there is this funny like it is trying to go against a lot of these concert norms and um it's it's just so hard you know for as as performers and compose you know we are really trained to kind of do a certain thing and um even though like just letting loose is like actually a real challenge for for in our, in our field just because that's just not the way we're taught so um yeah this piece is meant to be like a let loose piece <laughs>
At the same time though, when you look under the hood and look at the score, there are a lot of uh, specific notation for the, the, actual, the actual instrumental part. I mean, mm -hmm. you have things where the, the, um, the strings are told to dig in, make a noisy and dirty sound with slight overpressure, and you notate the glissandos exactly, uh, at least to me, looking at the score, it seems like you want them to follow a certain contour. You have, uh, you know, you notate the specific multiphonics and the wind parts. There has to be, to get the sense of freedom, there has to also be like, at, at least in my view, when listening to your music, there has to be some sort of parameter uh, you know, that's a terrible composerly word, but <laughs> there has to be, uh, you know, some sort of baseline where you can, where you can be free. And I think that you established that and that's how we could hear all the free stuff as free. Um, right. I, that, that's just my very hearing of it. Yeah, no, that's true. And I think, you know, I always, I think especially in recent years, I've been really trying to be very, um, think really carefully about timbre and things like that, like the dig in, um, like really think about the range of expressivity of sound that you can get uh, just with simple changes in a bow, you know, with bow pressure or, you know, on a wind instrument, just changing even the pressure of, of the air and how that affects things. Um, it, you know, I, I'm really fascinated by that. And that's something that I think a lot of other culture cultural practices of music already do and it's something that i think we actually are in western classical music don't actually think as much about that as much as other cultures do and so i think that's something that i've been really trying to explore in my music but then it, you're right it's like the same thing i mean i i'm indian and like i i learned a little bit of like hindusani music growing up and like even there it's actually it's like it's all improv based but actually there's a really standard way of like timbre and and really thinking about um like oh this beat cycle like there are these constraints that allow this kind of expressivity to happen within these these constraints and it's kind of a similar thing here where like i have a certain like you said parameters um or a little structure for them to be free in but i think that helps actually achieve a freer sound than if if i had just kind of left everything up to them. You mentioned Hindustani music. Um, I know some of your music does deal with that tradition. Uh, the, I guess the four that I picked doesn't, don't deal with it um, like head on, I, I guess. But there are things like you mentioned, these, this idea of parameter, this idea of control, uh, and the idea of like uh, uh, letting loose within a set parameter. It does come from Hindustani music, and I know, and I know it also comes from the Arabic uh, music tradition, mm -hmm. of course, because that's that's what I deal with primarily. Um, in your work going forward, I guess this is kind of a loaded question, but in in your work going forward, what do you see yourself uh, doing in the next five, ten years? I would say. I mean, is there when you're writing piece to piece, do you feel like you have a like a greater goal for what you'd like your music to be in five years, let's say, or 10 years? Or um, is it more like, you know, I, you're not, you don't concern yourself with these kind of things. It's more project-based and it's more day-to-day. -day. Um, kind of a, maybe a strange question, but I feel like some composers I've spoken to, they have kind of a general goal with what they want to do with their music. Uh, but then some composers are more Okay, it's more about the project. It's more about what is happening in that moment. To hell with everything <laughs> five years from now or 10 years from now. Uh, can't even imagine what life is going to be like then. Yeah, I think I'm in between. But I, but I think that I, I, I it's less maybe about um, what I want my music to do versus what I, the kind of artist I want to be, I think. Um, and you know, something that I've been really thinking a lot about, especially with the pandemic. And I think this is the pandemic is, I mean, obviously it was really destructive and it was really painful for a lot of people. You know, there are a lot of people who were sick or lost family members or, you know, there's a grief filled time. But at the same time, I also think in a way we're talking about like constraints and things like that. Um, by not having the same concert model, by not having us all be in the same uh, 
physical space where we're having the same live model of somebody performing and, you know, we're sitting in the audience again in the same room um, uh, that we always had. You buy tickets to sit in the audience, you know, like that same kind of rigid model. I think that we had to explore a lot of other creative outlets. And, and initially it was, I think, really hard for a lot of um, organizations. I think a lot of people were trying to do these really watered down Zoom performances, which weren't super stellar, <laughs> honestly, because that music isn't really meant for those um, mm-hmm. environments, you know. But then I think there were also a lot of artists who did really amazing work, you know, with video, people who kind of really prioritize electronics and things like that. Um, people who tried to write music that was um, kind of with like creatively based on not being in the same space as your other performers and how that could be used as like um, like a creative outlet rather than just like, oh, I, it's not what it should have been, but I'm just going to do it this way. You know, it's like that's how it's supposed to be. Um, and, you know, I tried to write a few pieces like that, which were based on remote performance. Um, I tried to explore more stuff with video with actually the the turn your feet around piece. I'm, I'm right now I'm making a, a video that's quite fun. (laughs) Uh, But um, yeah, so I think in terms of the stuff that I want to do, I think it's kind of related to that, you know, with the pandemic, I I really want, um, like to kind of move in a direction where I'm exploring a lot more multimedia, I'm exploring um, different ways of creating just to keep myself engaged. And also like, whoever is engaging with my work like keep them on their toes honestly but um but then also I think with the pandemic I I was thinking a lot about um you know it was at the same time also as like the George Floyd protests and and um you know a lot of um these social movements that were happening in in the world and you know I think a lot of the classical art world really did a reset and thinking like is this what we want our field to be? Is it as inclusive as we want it to be? Like, what is the point of what we're doing? And from that, you know, I, I've been doing a lot more like education work and things like that. I'm, I'm doing a, a big project with Yola right now um, where I'm designing a little curriculum and uh, the, the kids are like con- contributing samples, which are going to be like the piece that they end up playing. Um, you know, doing more work like that, I think, you know, where you're working with kids who are like at the root of, um, you know, you know, we always talk when we talk about like social inequality, we, a lot of times people are thinking of like the top level down working that way. But I really think it's important to start from the beginning, um, you know, cause education is such a vehicle for, for progress, honestly. So I think, you know, all of these things that I've been wanting to do, um, you know, in five, 10 years from now are kind of related to this really thinking about, who am I working with and is it as meaningful as possible? And I think I'm constantly reevaluating whatever I'm doing to keep moving towards that goal. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, we can even talk a whole hour about uh, your other, uh, your other efforts besides composing, of course, because that's a whole different uh, side of you, but obviously related in your music, but you know, like you mentioning all these things, what your music, all the music that we mentioned today, I could easily see, you know, a group of middle school kids, you know, uh, listening to that music and getting something out of that music without even knowing anything particularly about uh, classical music in general, which is so difficult uh, to do these days. Uh, you know, oftentimes a lot of concert goers, they, they, com- they complain, oh, I have to have a PhD in composition or, or music to, to understand uh, the piece, but with your p- your music, even though it doesn't, uh, even though you do use a lot of you know quote unquote modern techniques and, and this kind of thing, it's presented in such a way uh, that again, like what you said earlier about the microtonal schema not being at the forefront, uh, it's a tool to get the your your beliefs uh, and the core of who you are out there, rather than it being the thing that it's about, which is is uh, it's a tough thing to do. Uh, it was well. It was never never easy in any age, really. But especially now, with all the different th- tools that we have. Yeah. Um, what do you look forward to most in this upcoming season? Now that we've started back into it, we were. It's funny we were talking about like, oh, can we use this as to our advantage, not being in the same space, but also, you know, 
I do have a soft spot for concerts. I really love being in the same room with people. I love collaborating with people, you know, you know, getting dinner after, you know, like all those normal experiences of just, um, you know, I think music, our field is so small, but it's also, I think that's what makes it special. You know, we all get to know each other as people and beyond even just as artists. Um, and so I'm really excited to be working with, with Ju Wang, um, uh, the pianist for, for YCA. That's the first, um, of my commissions. And I'm, it was just really lovely working with him. I felt like we really, um, connected just kind of on like an immigrant level you know um he uh is an immigrant um from china and i uh you know come from an immigrant family from india um and we realized we had a lot of shared experiences and so i i'm really excited to be working on this piece uh for him which i'm just finishing (laughs) so i'm excited (laughs) uh but besides that i'm also um really thrilled to be having some other concerts coming up which i'm still praying every day that they won't get canceled (laughs) because that nobody knows anything right now but yeah i i I have a a show with uh new york phil um they're performing uh, an orchestra piece of mine called lumina i believe it's like may 12th through 14th um they're performing it a few times and i'll have that down in the description below the link for that sure sure yeah yeah and also dear abby actually is being performed by um L.A. Phil, uh, uh, Natalie Joachim and Pamela Z are curating one of their Green Umbrella concerts. And so I'm really excited. They're going to be the two singers, uh, Natalie and and Pamela, um, with L.A. Phil. And that's going to be super exciting. That's in January of next year. Um, But yeah, I honestly, I'm just super excited to be working with um, musicians again in hopefully a closer way than to what was before the pandemic than, than not. And um, I'm just really excited to be just in the same space as a lot of people again. And I think, you know, we need that also. As much as we love video and everything else like that, I mean, I, I love that too. But, you know, there's nothing that can really replace just being in the same room with somebody else. And I can't agree with that more. And uh, thanks so much, Nina, for... Uh, you know, talking about your music, talking about your approach. It was really great to talk to you. Uh, please uh, please uh, check out more of Nina's music on her website, ninashaker.com. Uh, make sure to follow Young Concert Artists on YouTube and Instagram uh, to keep up with uh, not just Nina, but all the other uh, Young Concert Artists on the roster. And uh, if you liked what you saw today in this video, please be sure to like the video and subscribe to my channel. I'll be posting Uh, a lot of interviews like this and a lot of uh, tips and uh, general advice for composers and musicians going forward. And thank you again, Nina, so much. Uh, It it was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saad. And I'm so excited to be part of YCA.